What's up, everybody? Welcome to DFS by the Numbers. These are my full card breakdown and predictions for UFC Vegas 41. We have Paula Costa going against Marvin Vittori in what should be a very, very good main event. I feel like this main event is going to blow the last three out of the water that have not really delivered, but this one I, I think is going to deliver for sure. I think the card is going to deliver. Um, it's a pretty solid card. I think there's some good betting opportunities as well. I already have three or four bets locked in already, so yeah, looking forward to this card for sure. Next week, we have UFC 267 and then UFC 268 back to back so that should be fun so yeah i mean i'm not gonna lie these last couple cards in terms of you know watching them as a fan have been a little bit rough but you know we're going to get rewarded very soon with 267 and 268 which are both phenomenal cards so i say we get into the breakdown talk about some fights before we do so if you can please leave a like on the video one small like always goes a long way also subscribe to the channel if you have not already of uh, content coming out throughout the week DraftKings video coming out soon um, have the live stream on Friday after the weigh-in 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern time and then going live for best bet um, one hour prior to when the prelims start with me Uncle Weezy Narco Cop and having a very special guest this week I think you guys are going to like him quite a bit so yeah lots going on throughout the week as always but we have UFC Vegas 41 here and I say we start with the very first fire of the night and, uh, yeah, we have L Livion Souza going against Random Marcos. We have Souza. She is 30 years old, 5'3", with a 63-inch reach, 14-3, and 3-2 and in her last five fights. Random Marcos, she is 36 years old, 5'4", 63-and-a-half-inch reach, 10-11, and 1-4 and and in her last five fights. Random Marcos is on a four-fight losing streak. How is she in the UFC? I'm, I'm not too sure, but if she does lose this fight, this will be five in a row, and I would be shocked if it was not her last fight in the UFC. So this is a, a must-win situation here for Randa Marcos. So Souza, she's going to be younger by six years. Um, she's going to be at a one-inch height disadvantage and also a half an inch of reach disadvantage as well. So we'll take a look at the odds, and then I do want to get into the stats in terms of some of these fights, and this first one is one of them. So we take a look at the odds. First of all, I recommend nobody bets on this fight. I mean, uh, I would not go anywhere near this fight from a betting perspective. But taking a look at the odds, we see that Souza, she opened up minus 150. She's currently minus 123. And then we see that Marcos, she opened up plus 130. She's now plus 103. So the line is closing, which, you know, it probably should be a straight pick em here. This is a really tough fight to call. But I say we get into these striking numbers. So Livion Souza, she averages 2.06 significant strikes per minute with a 45% accuracy. Um, she does absorb 3.38 with a negative significant strike differential of 1.32, but she does have a pretty solid 62% strike in defense. As far as Random Marcos, she does average 2.87 significant strikes per minute with a 42% striking accuracy. She also absorbs more than she's giving up uh, or giving out 3.27 absorb per minute uh, with a negative 0.4 significant strike differential and a 58% strike in defense. So in terms of the grappling stats, and this is, I think, the key to this fight. So Souza, you know, pretty decent at getting it down to the mat. I believe she has a judo background. She averages 2.4 takedowns per 15 minutes with a 44% takedown accuracy. She does have a really bad 40% takedown defense. I think that's more so because she's very comfortable to be on her back. Um, she's a pretty solid grappler, as is Randall Marcos, though. Um, Marcos does average 1.2 takedowns per 15 minutes with a 28% accuracy, and she also has a really bad 52% takedown defense. So I think what it's going to come down to is, you know, who is going to get this down to the mat? Who's going to try to get it there first? And I'm kind of leaning on the Souza side here. Um, again, there's, there's not much confidence in this pick because you really can't be confident in Souza. She looked horrible in her last fight against Amanda Lemos. She looked like uh, she just wasn't all that there. I think she landed one strike, and the fight lasted, you know, three and a half minutes. Amanda Lemos absolutely teed off on her, uh, knocked her down twice, got her out of there. It was a horrible matchup for Livion Souza. Um, but this is a different matchup, right? Uh, Marcos, she has a 52% takedown defense. I think Souza's going to exploit that. We saw Souza take down Ashley Yoder, win a decision. We saw uh, Souza take down Brianna Van Vuren two times. We saw her take down Sarah Froda four times. And Marcos has been taken down, you know, several times throughout her career. Uh, even in her last couple of fights, Juana Panero took her down five times. Kanako Barada took her down four times. Uh, Yoder took her down twice as well, controlled her for a lot of that fight. So, yeah, I think the path to victory for Souza is going to be getting this fight down to the mat. Uh, Marcos, 
you know, she can be stuck off her back at times. So I think if it does stay standing for any periods of this time, it's going to look really, really ugly. Like I can't even tell you who's going to have the striking advantage. Maybe Souza, but I think this fight's primarily going to play out on the mat. And at that point, I do think Souza gets the takedowns. And I think she does get some control time and win a decision here, possible submission. But I'm going to say Souza wins a decision. Again, you can't be too confident in this fight. Extremely low level, not high on either fighter, but uh, I will take Souza as far as a pick, and I will take her to win by decision. All right, yeah, this should be a really fun fight. Looking forward to this fight for sure. We have Jeff Molina going against Daniel uh, Lacerda. We have Jeff Molina, who is training out of Glory MMA and Fitness with James Krause. He is 24 years old, five foot six with a 69-inch reach, 9-2. And 5-0 and in his last five fights. Daniel Lacerda, he is 25 years old, 5'6". Uh, not sure on the reach, but he's 11-1 and and 3-2 and in his last five fights. So, we'll take a look at the odds. And Molina, open at minus 170. He's currently minus 175. And Lacerda, open at plus 145. And he's currently plus 150. So, Molina came out in his UFC debut. I'll never forget that card, UFC 261, uh, the very first card where the fans were back, and Molina put on a heck of a fight against um, Iori Kuleng, where Kuleng's a very tough guy. He took a lot of shots. He took actually 189 significant strikes, and he just wouldn't go down. But, you know, Kuleng was having success early. I did pick Molina in that fight, and I was very worried after that first round because Kuleng was getting the better of him. Uh, the second round was much closer, um, but Molina ends up, I believe, dropping him at the end of the second round. And then the third round, Molina just puts it on him. Kuleng slows down. Molina, I want to see how much significant strikes he landed in that third round. Molina landed 127 significant strikes just in the third round. Like, that is crazy. This guy's pace is phenomenal. His cardio is phenomenal. His heart is phenomenal. And we saw it in that Kuleng fight. So this is a tough fight to call. This is a really tough fight to call because of the lack of information. Daniel Lacerda, we don't know much about him. What we do know, though, is he has a 100% finish rate, and he has a brown belt in BJJ. 55% um, of his wins come by submission, 45% come by knockout, and I could literally watch only three fights on this guy. Three fights. He has 12. I can only watch three, so that's a bad sign right off the bat, and from what I saw, you know, his wrestling's good. His grappling's really good. I've seen him get multiple submissions. I saw him get a head kick knockout as well. He looks pretty solid, but the problem is he's been to the second round one time in 12 fights. He's fighting some low-level competition. We don't know a lot about this guy. You know, is his gas tank bad? Is, it, is his gas tank good? We don't know. We literally don't know because we have not seen it. We've seen him go into the second round once, um, and it's not on tape. So this fight's really hard to, to, uh, to call here. I do have some red flags on the Molina side, though. Molina's takedown defense is very, very questionable. Molina actually has a 16% takedown defense. Like, that. that's a concern, especially in a fight like this where Lacerda is going to try to take down Jeff Molina, a 16% takedown defense. And it's not only in the UFC on the and on the Contender Series. Uh, Kuleng was able to take him th down three times. Jacob Silva on the contender series was able to take him down two times but even like outside of the UFC Molina's getting taken down fairly easy and if Lacerda is able to take him down you know I don't really like that for Molina um it's a tough fight to call again I can see Lacerda having success early potentially getting an early finish or I can see Molina you know surviving that that early storm that Lacerda is most likely going to bring um getting the fight into deep waters and then eventually getting a late finish um, you know, I'm actually going to take the dog here. I'm going to take a shot on Lacerda. You know, I really do like what I saw in the limited fight tape that I did watch in those three fights and just seeing Molina, you know, really struggling against guys taking him down and, and he can be taken down like so easy to a point where it's a serious concern. Like you see it right there, a 16% takedown defense like that. That's not good. And that's not good. So I could see a scenario where Lacerda is able to get him out of there early, use that BJJ Brown belt. Molina has been submitted before. Or Molina is able to survive, take over late. But I'm going to say that Lacerda does get him out of there in that first round. Um, I'm probably going to be the only only one of the people uh, one of the only people picking Lacerda here. But I'll take a shot on the guy. He looks good to me, and I have seen Molina taken down a lot more than I like, especially in this matchup. So give me Daniel Lacerda for the win. Give me a first round submission. All right, this is another banger. We have Kama Worthy going against Jai Herbert, a fight that I'm really looking forward to. Um, this fight is my favorite fight on the card. Uh, it should be an absolute banger, and it should be one that does bring some violence. Both guys bring a ton of violence. We have Herbert, 33 years old, six foot and one with a 77 inch reach, 10 and three, and three and two in his last five fights. Kama Worthy, 35 years old, five foot 11, 74 inch reach, 16 and eight. And 3-2 and in his last five fights. We will take a look at the odds here. 
And Herbert opened up minus 105, and he's currently minus 185. And Worthy opened up minus 115, and he's currently plus 160. So lots of money coming in on Herbert, and I understand why. Um, and, and the reason why is because Herbert is the much better fighter, and I really don't think it's close. Like, I've never been high on Kama Worthy. He comes into the UFC against Devontae Smith. I'll never forget it. Uh, Devontae Smith was nearly a, a 1,000, a minus 1,000 favorite, and then Kama Worthy knocks him out. Um, never forget that moment because I had a ton of uh, Devontae Smith and DraftKings. But, and then after Worthy knocks out Devontae Smith, he does submit Luis Pena. So, you know, I'm like, okay, you know, maybe I was wrong about Kama Worthy, you know, because you take a look at him outside of the UFC and he just, he's just not great. But he comes in, gets two UFC wins. Very impressive. But after that, he gets knocked out in the first round by Otman Azaitar. And then after that, he gets knocked out in the first round by Jamie Malarkey. This guy could be one of the chinniest fighters in the UFC. This guy's chin is is just gone. He does not have a chin. Seven knockout losses for Kama Worthy, and he's been finished in every single one of his losses. This guy's never lost a decision in 24 professional fights. That's 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 crazy, right? Not seven knockout losses, one submission loss. You know, Jai Herbert, he's chinny as well. Like, he got knocked out by Reese McKee, and the reason why is because his striking defense is horrible. 46% thus far, he's very hittable. He leaves his hands down. He backs up with his chin in the air, and that's kind of what happened in the Reese McKee fight. Reese McKee came forward um, and knocked him out, knocked him out, and that's not good. And then he also got knocked out by Chernado in that third round in his UFC debut. Um, i got to pick Herbert here because he is the better fighter. He's younger. He's going to have a height advantage. He's going to have a reach advantage, a three-inch reach advantage. I think that's big here. Um, and I do like what I see from him, at least offensively. Offensively, this guy is very talented. But defensively, he lacks a lot. But this fight, there's no way this fight's going to be boring. Both guys are dangerous. Both guys are very dangerous finishers. Both guys lack striking defense. I think Herbert sits around 46% worthy. He sits at like 43. And both guys have no chin. So this should be fun. I can almost guarantee that somebody's probably going to get knocked out. And I'm going to say that Herbert does get it done. But do I like the money line? Not really because Worthy's very live. Like Worthy hits like a truck himself. And uh, Herbert does have those defensive liabilities. So, yeah, you know, I think it's going to be violence here. I'm going to say Herbert does get the knockout. Worthy's chin is shot. He's now 35 years old. He's getting up there. He's been knocked out several times. Um, I think he does take another knockout loss, which would be three in a row. And which would be like eight for his career. So I'm going to take uh, Herbert. The younger guy, the more talented guy to get the knockout, but you can never count out a guy like Kama Worthy. He does have that death touch. So give me uh, Herbert for a, I'll say a first round knockout. All right, next we have Loriana Staropoli going against Jamie Pickett, a fight that we were supposed to see a couple weeks ago. Got taken off, and to be honest, um, I wasn't mad. I mean, this is not a fight that I'm looking forward to that much. Originally, I thought it was going to be all over Staropoli, but after digging into it, I think it's going to be a big, giant pass for me. But um, we'll take a look at Staropoli. is 28 years old, 6 foot 1, 71 and a half inch reach, 9 and 4, 2 and 3 in his last five fights. Jamie Pickett, 33 years old, 6 foot 2 with an 80 inch reach, 11 and 6 and 2 and 3 in his last five fights. So some red flags right at the bat. First of all, Staropoli is going to be five years younger. That's good. But he's going to be very undersized here. This is not his weight class. Um, he's too small for this weight class, especially against Jamie Pickett, who's going to have a one inch height advantage. And he's also going to have a massive eight and a half inch reach dis disadvantage there. So, yeah, I don't like that. Jamie Pike Pickett's going to be much bigger, but we'll take a look at the odds here. And we do see that Staropoli is a, a huge favorite. And I don't know if it's really warranted. I, I get that Pickett's not that great, but my goodness, you know, Staropoli is on a, a huge skid himself. Staropoli opened up minus 200. He's now minus 240. And Pickett opened up plus 170. He's now plus 205. So, yeah, I would stay far, far away. But in terms of picking a winner, um, I got to go star polling. I think he is the better fighter. And you even take a look at who he's losing against. So he lost against Roman DeLidzi, somebody that's much, much bigger, much, much stronger. Um, he lost to Tim Means, obviously a very good fighter. And then Muslim Salikov, obviously really good fighter. So he is losing two really good guys. So we got to give that to him. You know, Jamie Pickett got knocked out by the Beverly Hills Ninja in his last fight. That's not good. And then he also lost to Tafan and Chukwu by decision. Didn't really offer much in that fight. Um, you know, I guess what I'm worried about on the star Staropoli side is if Jamie Pickett does decide to use his size um, and take down Staropoli, we have seen Staropoli taken down several times. His takedown defense isn't great, 
but that's not really Jamie Pickett's games. I mean, he goes out for takedowns here or there, but um, I think this is primarily going to stay standing, and if it does, like, I, I still favor Star Poli, but again, like, the eight and a half inch reach disadvantage is something that'll scare me away, especially from the money line. Like, I would not touch this fight, but um, I'll go Star Poli by a very, I think it's gonna be a very close decision, but I will say, I think he's the much more talented fighter in this fight, but I think the size is just what's scaring him away, me away, but I'll go Star Poli to snap that three fight skid, and this is probably a, a loser leaves the UFC fight. You gotta imagine it is. Because both guys have not been looking great at all. But yeah, give me the more talented guy in Star Poli. I think he does get it done. Probably a close fight. Um, don't bet this one. So give me Star Poli by a close, greasy decision. All right, yeah, looking forward to this one. We have Tabitha Ricci going against Maria Oliveira. We got the Baby Shark. Looking forward to the return of the Baby Shark. And I think that um, the UFC is doing her a big favor here against Maria Oliveira after putting her against one man on Fioro, up a weight class, on short notice, bad combination. As we see, uh, man on Fioro is the real deal. So we have Ricci. She is 26 years old, 5'1", with a 62-inch reach, 5-1, and 4-1 and and in her last five fights. We have Maria Oliveira, 24 years old, 5'6", with a 69-inch reach, 12-4, and 3-2 and and in her last five fights. So Oliveira is going to have a 2-inch a two-age advantage. She's going to be two years younger. She's going to have a five-inch height advantage, and she's going to have a seven-inch reach advantage. So Maria Oliveira is going to be much bigger than Tabitha Ricci. So we take a look at the odds here, and Tabitha Ricci, I believe she is the, the third biggest favorite, uh, fourth biggest favorite, right behind Star Poli, uh, Grant Dawson, and um, who else? And Sung Woo Choi. So she is the fourth favorite, biggest favorite on the card. Open at minus 180. She's now minus 230. And then Maria Oliveira opened up plus 155. She's currently plus 195. And I'll be honest, I'm not, I'm scratching my head here. I'm really scratching my head on why Maria Oliveira is getting an opportunity in the UFC here. Because you take a look at her and, you know, she's not great. She fought on the contender series against Marina Rodriguez. She pulled a Charlie Ontivero. She got elbowed in the head and she kind of just walked away and quit. Um, and then I've seen like multiple fights where she's been getting taken down like easily. I saw her get submitted like with no resistance at all. Like it's not, it's not great. And her last fight, she got a nice finish win, but it was against, I think it was against an O and O fighter. So her very last win was against an O and O fighter. She gets the call here to go against Tabitha Ricci. My thinking is, I think the UFC is just doing Ricci a favor. I mean, Ricci did uh, the UFC a favor, went in on short notice against Manon Fioro, up a weight class, horrible matchup. She looked awful, and how can you blame her? Manon Fioro was much bigger, the much better striker. It wasn't even close. Ricci would have needed to get the fight down to the match. She obviously couldn't do that. She was much smaller. Horrible matchup. So I think the UFC is kind of, you know, trying to build up Ricci. You know, she's very marketable, uh, the baby shark. I think people like her a lot. Um, so I think that that's what the case is here. Cause you know, I don't really see it with Maria Oliveira. I don't see, um, anything like even like the striking, she's, she looks okay against these lower level fighters. But when she gets put in there, like against Rodriguez, like it wasn't, it wasn't even close. Like she took an elbow and she quit. So yeah, I don't get it. I, I think Ricci is the better fighter. She's actually a really good grappler. I was really impressed with what I saw in terms of Ricci and her ability to get it down to the mat. And when she's on the mat, she's vicious. She's a black belt in BJJ, you know, Oliveira, no takedown defense, no ground game. I think everything's lining up for a tab of the Ricci sub. The one thing that I don't like about Ricci in this matchup is going to be the size. Uh, Oliveira is going to be much bigger. You know, she's going to have a reach advantage, a height advantage. But then again, the size isn't really going to matter if Oliveira is on her back. And that's where I expect her to be. So, yeah, I like Ricci here quite a bit. I think she does get it done. And I think she does get it done in very dominant fashion. The matchup makes no sense to me, but I think they're trying to build up Ricci here. So give me Tab of the Ricci for the win. And give me Tab of the Ricci by second round submission. Looking forward to the fight. I really am. All right. This fight should be fun as well. We have Jung Young Park going against Gregory Rodriguez. We have Park, who is 30 years old, 5'10", with a 73-inch reach, 13-4, and 4-1 and four and in his last five fights. Gregory Rodriguez, 29 years old, 6'3", with a 76-inch reach, 10-3, and 4-1 and four and one in his last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds, and it's a straight pick -em. So Park opened at minus 170. He's currently minus 110. 
Rodriguez opened at plus 145. He's now minus 110. And I, I completely agree with the line movement. This is a very, very close fight. I like both guys a lot. I think both guys bring a lot of good things to the table. So Park, I really like his striking. Obviously, in the UFC, he's been using that takedown heavy game plan in a bunch of his fights. The problem is I don't think that's going to be on the table here against Gregory Rodriguez, who is a legit a legit grappler. This guy's grappling is phenomenal. He doesn't use it a ton. I'd like to see him use it more, but he kind of, it seems like he fell in love with his striking, and, and rightfully so. This guy is really well-rounded. But Park, he uh, beat Tafan and Chuku in his last fight. He beat John Phillips, which John Phillips has a has a 7% takedown defense, uh, which has to be the worst I've ever seen. Um, and then he did beat Mark Underberio, getting him down five times. The one fight he did lose was his UFC debut against Anthony Fluffy Hernandez, where uh, Fluffy Hernandez actually took him down six times. Um, and he ended up submitting him in the second round. And, you know, I kind of think that could be a path to victory for Gregory Rodriguez, who, like I said, he doesn't go to his takedowns a ton. But we did see him, you know, take down Dusko Todorovic three times. He was three for five on his takedowns, very efficient. I feel like that's kind of a path to victory here against Jung Young Park, who has a 46% you know, takedown defense. Um, but my concern about Rodriguez is the chin. We saw him get knocked out on the contender series really bad against Jordan Williams, who has since then not had much success in the UFC, but it was a brutal knockout, and I think he's been knocked out twice as well. So, yeah, the chin of Rodriguez definitely does concern me. Um, it's a close fight. I mean, I think on the feet, both guys are, are pretty similar in terms of skill. I really like what I see from both guys. I like the volume. I like the striking. But I think on the mat is where the difference is. I think Rodriguez is the better grappler. I think Rodriguez is going to get this fight down to the mat, exploit that 46% takedown defense of Jung Young Park, and win a very close fight. I actually think this goes to decision. Um, as weird as that sounds, because Park is uh, he's next level durable. You call him the Iron Turtle for a reason. This guy's chin is made out of iron. Can't say the same for Rodriguez, so maybe, you know, Park can clip him, but Park doesn't have any finishes in the UFC, and, you know, if you can't finish John Phillips, I, I really don't know what to say. So, yeah, give me uh, Rodriguez here. I'm going to say he does win a very, very close decision, mixing and takedowns here or there. I think the striking is going to be very competitive, but uh, so give me Rodriguez. Give me Rodriguez here by a very close competitive decision. All right, we're going to enter the main card here. We have Nikolai uh, Negamarianu going against Ike Villanueva. This fight, you know, it, it could be the lowest level fight on a main card of the year. It really could be. This is so low level, but I do understand why they put it on the main card because this fight's going to be an absolute banger. Um, you know, I'm a fan of both guys and their styles because um, it's exciting to watch. I mean, they might, might not be the, the most skilled fighters in the world, but this fight is going to be fireworks for as long as it lasts so we take a look at uh, Ike Villanueva and he is 37 years old he's 37 years old he's definitely getting up there six foot one with a 73 inch reach 18 and 12 and two and three in his last five fights Nikolai Negamarianu 27 years old six foot one with a 78 inch reach 10 and one and four and one in his last five fights so yeah, Nikolai is going to have a one-inch height disadvantage, but this is really weird. He's going to have a five-inch reach advantage, uh, which could definitely play key or be key in a fight like this where it's going to be, you know, a fight where they just stand and bang until one man falls, you got to imagine. Um, but yeah, Nikolai Negamarianu, lots of question marks about this guy. He comes in to uh, the UFC, and he loses to Saberbag Safarov. It's taken down three times, looks awful, and then we don't see him again for like two and a half years, comes back against Alexa Kamor, and he wins a, a very close fight. This was weird because Alexa Kamor actually outlands him 102 to 71, and that was the fight where Negamarianu grabbed the cage like a million times, and the ref would not take a point. Um... So yeah, really weird fight, but Nega Marianu was one for five on takedowns. He did have four minutes and 52 seconds of control time. He's hittable. He is very hittable. He has actually a 26% striking defense, which is worse than, you know, fighters like Priscilla Ketchup beating. Like, it is very, very bad. Uh, he was getting hit clean by Kmore, but what I will say about Nega Marianu is this guy is durable. He ate a lot of hard shots, and he just kept coming forward. I don't know if I can say the same thing about Ike Villanueva. Ike Villanueva is a very tough guy. You know, he has a ton of toughness. He comes forward. Um, you got to walk through fire to finish this guy. But he has been finished quite a bit. 
Um, he's been finished a ton, actually. You take a look at how many finished losses Ike Villanueva has, and it's really concerning. He's been finished 11 times. 11 times in his 12 losses, 6 by knockout, 5 by submission. And I kind of think that Nega Mariano is going to try to get this fight down to the mat like he does in a lot of fights. So I went back and tried to find some takedown defense of Ike Villanueva. How's it looking? Because I don't believe in the UFC anybody's tried to take Ike down. But I saw some fights, and it's hard to tell because, uh, you know, the fights I've watched, a lot of them were at middleweight. But uh, his takedown defense looks good. His get-up game looks really good. Looks like he's a really tough guy to take down and hold down as well. So I kind of feel like this fight's going to be um, <laughs> standing. I think it's going to be exciting. I think they're both going to be throwing bombs until one man falls, and I kind of trust the durability of Nikolai Negamarianu more. Uh, Ike Villanueva, like I said, he's been he's been hurt a ton. He's been dropped a ton. Uh, again, you have to walk through fire to finish this guy, but you can finish this guy. 11 finished losses out of 12 total losses. Like, that's not great. Um, and Ishtin's not getting better. He's not getting younger. He's now 37 years old. Um, at least what I see from Nik uh, Nikolai Negamarianu is next-level toughness. This guy's durable. Um... So I got to go with the more durable guy in a fight that's going to finish. I got to go with the more durable guy, and I, I do think this is going to finish. 90% finish rate for Nikolai, um, and then an 83% finish rate for Ike Villanueva. All 83% coming by knockout. This guy is going to try to take his head off, and maybe he does. Like with the 26% striking defense, maybe he does. So I don't know. This is going to be fun. Um, give me the, the younger guy in Nikolai Negamarianu. Give me the guy that has more pass to victory if he does choose that wrestling. Give me the more durable guy as well. But I can tell you one thing. Someone's probably going to sleep in this fight. I'm going to say Ike does go down, but, um, you can't count out Ike. He's a dog. He's a dog. So we'll see. But give me Nikolai Negamarianu for the win and give me him to win by second round knockout. Cannot wait for this fight. I see why it's on the main card. All right, another fight that I feel like it's going to be pretty fun as well. We have Dwight Grant going against Francisco Trinaldo. Um, we have Francisco Trinaldo, who is 43 years old, five foot nine, with a 70 inch reach, 26 and eight, and three and two in his last five fights. Dwight Grant, 37 years old, six foot one, 76 and a half inch reach, 11 and three, and three and two in his last five fights. So, some red flags here. Um, some big red flags here. Uh, Dwight Grant is going to be six years younger. Trinado is 43 years old, which makes him one of the oldest fighters on the UFC roster. Um, Dwight Grant is going to have a 4-inch height advantage and a massive 6.5-inch reach advantage. So all of that does favor Dwight Grant. And Dwight Grant's not a young guy himself. He's, he's 37, but you know, still, 37 is a lot better than 43 years old. Um, we do take a look at the odds, though. Um, don't know if I mentioned it last fight, but Nega Mariano is actually minus 212, and Ike Villanueva is plus 182. Would not recommend betting on Nikolai at that price tag, but um, I think he does get it done. And then as far as this fight, we see that Francisco Trinado opened up minus 160. He's currently minus 125. Dwight Grant opened up plus 140. He's currently plus 105. So, yeah, I'm not a big fan of, of Dwight Grant. Um, you know, he's somebody that has a ton of power. He's a finisher, 64% knockout rate. The dude hits hard, um, but he's so low volume. But with his low volume, he's actually landing more significant strikes than Trinado. He lands 3.36, absorbing only 2.17, whereas Trinado lands 3.08, absorbing 2.64. Um, it's a tough fight to call because, <laughs> you know, if this fight was a couple years ago, it's, it's Trinado all day. There's no question about it. But, you know, he's 43 years old. He's going to be at a massive height and reach disadvantage. Trinado is up a weight class at 170. I don't like that at all. Um, and if Trinaldo wants to win this fight, like how does he, is he going, if he wins this fight, Trinaldo wins this fight, it's going to be a very boring, um, decision where they kind of stare at each other a lot and that very well could happen and it could be close. Or if he wants to win the fight, you know, maybe get the fight down to the mat. But with that said, we've seen him go to that wrestling game plan. Um, even a couple fights ago against Jai Herbert, he was successful in getting Herbert down to the mat. But after the first round, he gassed out very bad. So especially at 43, is he going to come in here and have that wrestling heavy game plan? I just don't think so. I don't think he has the cardio to do that um, at all. So, you know, you take a look at Trinado. He has been knocked down in his last two fights. Herbert knocked him down. I believe it was in round two. And then Muslim Salikov knocked him down in his last fight. Francisco Trinado has never been knocked out, ever. In 34 fights, the dude's never been knocked out. And this is a hot take. I think Dwight Grant knocks him out here. He's now 43 years old. We've seen him hurt a lot. We've never seen him go down. I think he goes down here. You know, He's been knocked down twice in his last two fights. I think this is the fight 
where Dwight Grant puts him out and knocks him out. So give me Dwight Grant for the win. Give me Dwight Grant to win by knockout. The guy hits hard. I don't love his style. It's not great. He barely throws anything. But when he does land, it lands hard. And I think Ternaldo's chin is going to crack for the first time. I think he does go down for the first time. 43 years old. Huge size disadvantage. The reach is huge. Give me Dwight Grant for the win. And give me Dwight Grant by, give me first round knockout here. All right, next we have Sungwoo Choi going against Alex Caceres, which should be an interesting fight. We have Sungwoo Choi, 28 years old, 6 foot with a 74 and a half inch reach, 10 and 3, and 3 and 2 in his last five fights. Alex Caceres, 30 years old, 5 foot 10, 73 and a half inch reach, 18 and 12, and 4 and 1 in his last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds here. We see that Sungwoo Choi is the second biggest favorite on the card, and it keeps getting wider and wider. Open at minus 180. He's currently minus 290. Caceres opened up plus 155, and he's currently plus 250. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I like Choi quite a bit. This guy is a guy that kind of got fed to the Wolves in his very first fight in the UFC. The UFC definitely did him dirty. They, they, they matched him up against one Mosvar Evloev, you might know him, where Evloev was able to take him down five times. No shame in that loss at all. And then also ultimately Mosvar Evloev won a decision. After that, they matched him against Gavin Tucker. Same thing, Gavin Tucker took him down five times, ultimately ended up submitting him in that fight. Then they give him uh, Sumon Mokhtarian, ends up winning by decision, knocks him down in that fight. He beats Yusuf Zalal, good win. A lot of people were high on Zalal at the time. And then goes out there and knocks out Julian Arosa in that first round. And I'll tell you, that was the best version of Sungwoo Choi we have seen yet. I don't know if it was the blonde hair or what, but he looked sharp. He looked good. He looked phenomenal in the, in the, in the 1 minute and 37 seconds that we did see him. Like, everything that was landing, it was landing clean. It was landing hard. He looked great, and he's only going to get better. He's only going to get better. This guy is very good. you got to assume he's working on that takedown defense all the time, um, and I think he's going to be a problem. I really do think this guy is going to be a problem. Only 28 years old. Um, I like him quite a bit. But this is a matchup where you know I think it's going to be closer than the line does indicate. Like If this, if, if Choi does not knock out Alex Caceres, who, by the way, is very tough. Uh, Alex Caceres has only been knocked out. Um, I believe one time in his career. So he's he has a good chin on him. If he does not knock out Alex Caceres, I feel like it'll be competitive. But I think it's going to be one of those fights that are close. But you're going to clearly see who the winner is. Like, Choi's going to be landing the much more harder shots, the more eye-popping shots. Um, the shots that are really going to get the judges' attention where Caceres is going to be landing like the less meaningful shots. Maybe the the numbers in terms of the volume are going to be close, but we're going to know, you know, who's winning the fight. At least, you know, the, the, the fans at home will. I don't know if the judges will, especially after last week, the judging was very poor. So which is concerning, right? If you're if you're laying minus three hundred on a on a fighter and, and it goes to decision. Um, it's scary. It's terrifying because the judges don't know what they're looking at for the most part. So hopefully they get it right, though. I think Choi gets it done. Again, landing the harder shots, the shots that are going to make you know the fans say, ooh, ah, the limited fans that are at the apex. And I think he's going to win a decision here. Maybe he does knock out Caceres. Maybe he does. But Caceres is very tough. He's very durable. I'm going to say Choi does win a competitive but clear decision. Give me Choi by decision here. Cannot wait to see the growth of this guy, I cannot wait to see him back in there this Saturday. Looking forward to it. All right, Jessica Rose Clark going against Jocelyn Edwards. We have Rose Clark, who is 33 years old, 5'5", with a 67-inch reach, 10-6, and 3-2. And and in her last five fights, Jocelyn Edwards, 26 years old, 5'8", 70-inch reach, 10-3, and 3-2 and 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 in her last five fights. So we'll take a look at the odds. We see that Jessica Rose Clark opened up minus 150. She's now minus 133. Jocelyn Edwards opened up plus 130. She's now plus 113. So, yeah, Rose Clark coming off a little bit of a layoff. How long has it been? About about a year. It's been about a year since she uh, destroyed uh, Sarah Alpar. That was bad. Went back and watched that the other day, and very, very hard to watch. But, yeah, she looked good in that fight. But I believe she's coming off of, uh, an injury, coming off of a layoff. We'll see how she does come back here against Jocelyn Edwards, who, you know, I'm, I'm pretty impressed with her. But there is one glaring gaping hole in the, the game of Jocelyn Edwards, and that is going to be the takedown defense. The takedown defense is horrendous. It's 37% on paper. Carol Rose was able to take her down four times. Yanan Wu took her down once, and it's not just in the UFC. It's it's outside of the UFC as well. It's even worse. Like They both have the same common opponent. Um, Jessica Rose Clark beat Sarah Alpar bad. It wasn't even close. It wasn't even competitive. And then Jocelyn Edwards lost to Sarah Alpar by a split decision. Uh, I personally thought 
it wasn't really debatable. I thought Alpark got it done and, you know, went back and watched that fight. It was, again, two years and 10 months ago, but still very concerning when Sarah Alpar is taking you down, I want to say like almost 10 times or over 10 times, controlling you for a lot of that fight. It shows that there's a big weakness in the game of Jaws and Edwards, and that is in the takedown defense. She can't be controlled. She can't be held against the cage. But what I will say at range is she's very good. She's very good at range. She's very dangerous. She hits very hard as well. And she's going to have a, a nice size advantage here. She's going to have a five or a three inch height advantage, a three inch reach advantage. But, you know, if I'm Jessica Rose Clark, what I'm doing is I'm coming in here with the game plan of I'm going to get this fight down to the mat. Like even in the Sarah Alpar fight, she took Alpar down once and she was able to kind of grind Sarah Alpar against the cage for the majority of that fight. Kind of implement the same game plan here. Just hold her against the cage. You know, don't let her be at range where she's most comfortable. Take her down here or there. I think if Rose Clark comes in here with the game plan of doing that, she's going to make it look easy. It's going to be an easy fight. But, again, you, you can never... You can never trust these fighters fully to come out here and, and, and implement the right game plan. We see it time and time again where you're yelling at the TV like, what are you doing? Go for a takedown. And that could be the case. But, you know, I'm going to assume she's going to come in here with the right game plan. Take down Jocelyn Edwards. Um, no takedown defense. Not a great get-up game. I think it's a pretty easy game plan for Jessica Rose Clark if she does choose to implement that. And why I say that is because you take a look at Jessica Rose Clark, and that's not entirely her game. She averages about one takedown per 15 minutes. Um, which is not something you really like to see, but she was able to take down Beck Rawlings uh, two times. She took down Paige Van Zant two times. Um, she took down Sarah Alpar once. I think she needs to implement that same game plan of getting Edwards down to the mat here, and I think she does. I think she wins by decision, but yeah, don't have a great feeling about this fight, but I'm going to say Jessica Rose Clark does get it done by decision here. Um, takedowns are key. Control time is key. At range, She's not a bad striker, but I really do like what I see from Edwards. But give me a Rose Clark to get it done by decision. All right, co-main event, we have Grant Dawson going against Ricky Glenn, which should be a pretty fun fight. really do like Grant Dawson. think he's somebody to uh, definitely look out for. Another guy out of Glory MMA and fitness with James Krause. We have Grant Dawson, who's 27 years old, 5'10", with a 72-inch reach, 17-1, and 5-0 and and in his last five fights. Ricky Glenn, 32 years old, 6 foot with a 70-and-a-half-inch reach. 22 and 6 and 3 and 2 in his last five fights. We see that Grant Dawson is the biggest favorite on the entire card, opening up minus 400, currently minus 340. And Ricky Glenn opened up plus 300, and he's currently plus 280. So, yeah, at first I thought this line was, yeah, probably off. Um, but after digging into it, I think the line is about accurate because we see that Ricky Glenn throughout his career has, you know, struggled with guys taking him down. Dennis Bermudez was able to take him down six times. Miles Jury was able to take him down twice. Um, Evan Dunham was able to take him down three times. And, you know, on the feet, like, Dawson really impressed me. Like, this guy is making improvements, you know, leaps and bounds. Each and every fight, you see so much improvements from Grant Dawson. Um, the striking looked good in his last fight against Leonardo Santos, who he actually outstruck Santos at distance, which that is very impressive. I'm very high on Leonardo Santos. And he did go 1 for 11 on takedowns. 1 for 13 on takedowns, actually. 1 for 13 on takedowns, but, you know, I, I do like seeing that because I like seeing guys implement a game plan and stick to that game plan, and that's what he did. He made it a grinding fight. He held Santos against the cage. He got 8 minutes and 18 seconds of control time, and Santos is not, you know, some scrub at all. Santos is great and has an 89% takedown defense, whereas you take a look at Rick Glenn, and he has a 66% takedown defense. He struggled with guys taking him down. You know, so, yeah, I like Grant Dawson here. I think he's going to, you know, get multiple takedowns, get a ton of control time. I don't know if he submits Glenn, though. Glenn is very capable off his back. You know, he definitely looks like he knows what he's doing. Not sure on the on the, on the the belt rank or anything like that. But um, Glenn does look capable off his back. You know, he hasn't been submitted in the UFC. Has been submitted before, but it was a while ago. So, yeah, I like Dawson here, though. Uh, Glenn did surprise a lot of people, including me, coming back after a a massive layoff. I want to say it was like almost a three-year layoff, and he knocked out Joaquin Silva in the first round, so that was good, but um, I think it's a bad matchup for uh, Glenn here. I think Dawson does take him down several times, uh, kind of controls him, kind of grinds him out, and wins a grinding, pretty clear decision. So give me Grant Dawson to win, and give me Grant Dawson to win by decision. Main event time, don't remind you guys that me and Uncle Weezy went live on my channel on Monday and gave a main event deep dive, went really deep into this fight, gave, uh, talked about some betting as well on there, so check that out if you have not yet. But we have Paula Costa going against Marvin Vittori, and I'll tell you what, this main event 
is good. It's it's a lot better than the last three main events. Uh, Dumont, Ladd, uh, Duran Rodriguez, which was an okay fight, um, and then Walker and Asantas, which was the worst fight of the year. So this is a good main event. I'm looking forward to it, and I am going to enjoy watching it. We have Vittori, who is 28 years old, six foot with a 74 inch reach, 17 four and one, and four and one in his last five fights. Paula Costa, 30 years old, six foot one with a 72 inch reach, 13 and one. And 4-1 and in his last five fights. We take a look at the odds. Marvin Vittori opened up plus 130. The line completely flipped. He's now minus 152. Paula Costa opened up minus 150. He's now plus 132. So I say we get into some stats on this one. So in terms of the striking, um, I favor Costa. You know, I favor the, the volume and the power of Costa, at least early. We'll talk more about you know, what's going to happen later in the fight. But early in the fight, I like Costa. He does land a ton of volume. Like this guy's volume is insane, landing 7.03 significant strikes per minute with a 57% accuracy, absorbing 6.7 with a positive 0.33 significant strike differential. The striking defense isn't great. He does absorb a lot. Uh, striking defense is 50%. That's not good. Marvin Vittori, on the other hand, uh, lands 3.88 significant strikes per minute with a 43% accuracy, absorbing 3.04 with a positive 0.84 significant strike differential and a 63% striking defense. So again, at least early, I do favor the power and the volume of Paula Costa, but Marvin Vittori striking is not bad himself. So in terms of the grappling stats, and this is the most intriguing and interesting part of this fight, Marvin Vittori is going to want to get this fight down to the mat. Um, he does land 2.24 takedowns per 15 minutes with a 47% takedown accuracy, and he does have a 78% takedown defense. Paula Costa, no takedowns in the UFC, and he has an 80% takedown defense. What I will say is... You know, Paul Acosta, watching tape on him, the guy is very, obviously very strong. You know, he's built, um, he's jacked, and he, he's very hard to hold down. He is very, very hard to hold down, and he's very hard to take down as well. Romero was able to take him down once. He got back up. Alawali, Bambozi was able to take him down twice. He got back up. And, you know, other than that, many people aren't really trying to take him down. I think he's uh, um, defended, like, 15 takedowns around there in his entire career in the UFC. So that's going to change here. Vittori's going to let him get him down to the mat. So Vittori has shown some very good wrestling in his last four fights. He was able to take down Adesanya four times in his last five in his last fight. He did control Adesanya for six minutes and 55 seconds of a 25-minute fight. He was able to take down Kevin Holland 11 times, and he actually controlled Kevin Holland for 20 minutes and one second of a 25-minute fight. He's able to take down Carl Roberson two times, but there's a big, big difference between Carl Roberson, who has a 45% takedown defense, Kevin Holland, who has a 50% takedown defense, um, compared to Paula Costa, who has an 80% takedown defense and has a much better takedown defense in general than a Holland or a Roberson. So it's a weird, interesting matchup here to break down because I feel like early Paula Costa is going to have a lot of success I actually don't think Vittori is going to have much success in terms of taking down Costa. Maybe he does get him down, but in terms of holding him down, I don't really see him do that, um, seeing him do that. And if he does not take him down, um, if it has, if it is at range, like he could be in trouble early. But what I like about Vittori, there's a lot of things I do like about him, but in this matchup in particular is the durability is next level for Vittori. You know, you got to hit this guy in the head with a brick to get him out of there. Um, he's been five rounds. That's huge. He's been five rounds in his last three fights. That's huge. That's experience. We've seen him go five rounds, whereas Paula Costa, we've only seen him go three rounds, I think, once in his career. So he's never been the, to the fourth round. He's never been to the fifth round. So I kind of think it's you know more so of a, a Paula Costa early or a Marvin Vittori late. I'm kind of leaning towards the Marvin Vittori late side due to the toughness, the durability of Marvin Vittori. Never been knocked out. Could it happen here? Sure. And then also the fact that he has been to the fifth round. He has been to the fourth round, so I do like that about him. But I, I, I guess another worry for me is if the, the game plan of Marvin Vittori, which I don't know what it's going to be. Obviously, nobody does besides him in his camp. But if he comes in here with the game plan of I'm going to spam takedowns for the first couple rounds try to get down Paula Costa. If he's not successful in doing so, that's going to really, you know, expend a lot of energy in. You know, I, I do think that Vittori is going to have success later in the fight, but if he does implement a game plan of I'm gonna go in here and just go for takedown after takedown, and if he does not get those, I really have concerns about his gas tank going forward because we saw in the Holland fight where he was getting takedowns easily, no resistance. 
Um, Holland made no attempt to get back up to his feet, and we saw that Vittori was gassed out. He was tired in that fight. It's going to be a lot harder to take down Costa. There's going to be a lot more resistance, so um, it's a tough fight to call. I, I feel like this fight really should be 50-50. I feel like it's Costa early. I feel like it's Vittori late, but even then, I don't know, right? Like, Vittori, we have seen him slow down in the past. Even in the, the Jack Hermanson fight, it looked like he was, like, dead tired in the third round, gets a second win, finishes strong. In the Holland fight, he was dead tired, so... I'm going to go with Vittori, though. I'm going to go with the guy that we have seen him go later into the fight. I think that's huge, and I think the fact that he's never been knocked out is huge as well. I think he's going to use that toughness and you know, take into the deep waters, get into the fourth and fifth round, and potentially find a late finish. I'm going to say Marvin Vittori does win. I'm going to say like a fifth round, either a TKO or a sub from Marvin Vittori. I'm going to say he survives that early storm and wins late. But, man, this is such a good fight. I'm looking forward to it. Let me know who you guys have down in the comments below. Um, and, yeah, that's about it. Those are the picks. That's the breakdown. Um, I do have about three or four bets out already. I think I have most of my action already completed. I'm attacking a lot of violence bets. I think it'll be a very violent card, which is my uh, is my go-to. So looking forward to that. And, of course, next week we're looking forward to UFC 267 and then in two weeks, 268. So we have a lot of great things to look forward to in terms of being a UFC fan. So that's awesome. So, yeah, guys, that's about it. If you guys can leave a like, that'd be much appreciated. As always, subscribe to the channel. Let's get those subs up. Let's get those likes up. Do appreciate all the support week in and week out. Um, I mentioned on Twitter that I am going to be releasing my new website, dfsbythenumbers.com. In the very new future, not going to give the, the release date out quite yet, but it's going to be a massive uh, massive jump from Patreon over to DFS by the numbers. I can do you know more things, personalize it, all that good stuff. You know, do kind of my own thing over there. So um, if you do want to, you know, go to DFS by the numbers.com put your email in there i'll be sending out when the release date will be and all that good stuff maybe a promo code as well so yeah lots of great things coming forward and it's all thanks to you guys so um, appreciate y'all hanging out again leave a like and uh yeah good luck let's make some money let's make some money i feel like it's a decent card from betting and a even even better card to watch from a fan perspective so yeah that's about it guys and good luck for ufc vegas 41 see you guys